Please join me in the call to worship. Let all God's people come. We will lift our voices to the Lord. God says, I will teach you the way you should go. So we will listen and follow God's way. Thank you. And we can all rise for the opening hymn in our pew hymnals. And it's uh, Be Thou My Vision, hymn number 468. Now, uh, uh, the Honorable Deacon Ann Pollander will lead us to the uh, invocation in Lord's Prayer. So this is the invocation to prepare us for the service this morning. And when we do the Lord's Prayer, we'll start with Heavenly Creator. All-knowing and all-caring God, we gather this day drained by another week. We are like a parched desert, empty and in need of replenishment. Visit us with your presence saturate us with your spirit and bathe us in your streams of living water so that refreshed our living might be a worship of you through loving our neighbors as we love ourselves and now for the lord's prayer our heavenly creator who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
kind of goes under the category of chewing gum and walking, so I don't we'll, we'll see how this goes. So, Good morning. How are you all today? I have to ask that question because it gives my family members time to make it up here from the balcony. <laughs> so Pastor Mitch started something that was kind of interesting, the mystery bag, right? And some of you actually participated. I see a couple people who participated in the mystery bag. And since then, uh, Deacon Harding and uh, Mr. Straub, Deacon Straub also. So I thought I would do the mystery bag and I would bring in some stuff that's very, very special to me. We'll see how this goes. We'll start with a big one because it's really... So anyhow, you know what that is? What is that? It's a, well, it's a broken skateboard deck. Well, that's special. <laughs> what else do I have in here? <laughs> Isn't this special? Anybody know what this is? Well, it, it was a tennis racket, yeah. <laughs> I, I somehow don't think I got the the whole thing right, did I? Well, there's the blade of an ice hockey stick. I do know what this is. This is a piece of the floor from the Mount Abe gym. But this one might be my favorite. Isn't this a real nice little treat? I bet you guys wish you had this, right? See, it's mildewed and all cracked. This little piece of wood came out of the Mayflower II in Plymouth, Mass, when they restored the Mayflower II. Now, do these look like really special things? Did I get the assignment right? Well, to me, they are special because this is what I can do with the Mount Abe Gym floor. 
There's a pair, pair of earrings from Mount Abe's gym floor. This is wood from the Mayflower too. Believe it or not, these are two slices from a tennis racket. So it made me wonder if I'm made in God's image and I can see something that's totally broken and seemed to be useless to most people and I can somehow see the beauty in that, it makes me wonder if God does the same thing. It has me asking, because parent, uh, when, as you get older, you'll ask these questions, because something tragic will happen to somebody young, or so, you'll lose somebody, and you'll say, okay, why did God make that happen? And I have to think that God doesn't make things like that happen. God allows those things to happen. I, I didn't go out and break the skateboard. I didn't go out and intentionally break a tennis racket, but I can see the beauty in it. And it makes me think that God can look at us and say, no matter what challenge you throw at me, I can turn it into something beautiful. Even to the point where uh, a group of people nailed God's son to a cross, and God just kind of smiled and said, wait till you see what I can do. <laughs> so they say it's better to give than to receive. So I, I would like to give each of you and I'm so happy that I have enough of these, but each of you, one of these bracelets made from skateboard deck. And as you, whoops, as you wear these, I want you to think about it, like if you're having a rough day, or things are not going so well, and you're really struggling, just look at the bracelet and think, you know what? God is going to take that and make something very beautiful out of it. So, so let us let us pray. Uh, let me challenge myself once again. <laughs> Lord, uh, thank you for one giving me this perspective uh, and how uh, I can now see that uh, in all my failures and things that I can think about that didn't go so well, uh, I can feel comfortable knowing that somehow you made something really special from that and that we are all special and we are all tools that you can use to make special things happen. Amen. And now I think they head to Sunday school. Great. Okay, so he said it all. We'll start with 51. I'll start and then you follow with the even verses. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us the flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. For those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching us in the synagogue, in the synagogue at Capernaum. Okay, we continue with 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said, said to them, Does this offend you? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. 
The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One, Lord. Thank you, Linda. So as I stated in the very, very beginning, this is the perfect time to dream. Uh, as a creative person, I love this time of year because everything seems to line up towards the dream. We just passed through New Year's where a lot of us will make New Year's resolutions and attempt to make our lives better. Uh, it's starting to warm up. We're starting to see the sap flow and we know that spring will be coming and the buds and the flowers will spring from the earth and create beautiful things. But we also know that it's Easter where uh, Jesus gave a whole new twist on the burden left to us by Adam and Eve and, and opened us up to new life uh, through grace and forgiveness and acceptance. <clears throat> now starting something new, especially if it's a challenging task, uh, can be hard. Uh, now, you're fighting a couple of different things when you start something new. Some of it is physics, physical nature, and some of it is animal instincts. And for physics, if you think about it, our physical nature is to be at rest. The physics in nature always wants us to, to return us to rest. Now, we might go outside of that nature, but if you watch, and hopefully not hypnotize yourself, you see that it will slowly return to rest. You drop a pebble into a pond, and you see ripples, but the ripples will soften out, and eventually the pond will return to rest. It's just our physical nature. We go through the day burning energy, and at night, what do we do? We sleep. Um, the other part is the animal part, the kind that we don't really want to lower ourselves to the status of an animal, uh, but we do have that in our genetics. Animals have an interesting way of going through life. They look for three things, food, shelter, and a mate. They don't look to make those things, they look for those things. And they, if one of those things is missing, they will move until they find all three. This makes taking care of animals or eradicating animals from your property somewhat difficult because uh, it reminds me of a story that Bob McKnight, the game warden, told me years ago. He and his wife, Rory, were sitting on the back deck, and there were uh, six gray squirrels running around. And these squirrels had done, you know, really mischievous things around the property. And Rory wanted the boys to shoot the squirrels. And Bob is like, yeah, no. And finally, over time, Bob said, okay, boys, have at it. Uh, Bob told me he, they shot 30 gray squirrels, and at the end, they had six gray squirrels around their property. <laughs> and it was because there was food and shelter and a mate in that area, and the next one would just move in. That's how animals see things. Now, in North America, north of the equator, we have puffins. South of the equator, we have their distant relative, the penguins. They both act very much the same, 
but they can't jump the habitat because they can't go through that warm water because they're not designed for it. So they pretty much stay where they're at. God has created us different from the animals in that we can jump those uh, vast areas and create habitat. If we wanted to live in Antarctica, we could bring a mate or a companion, we could arrange for food to come in, and we could build a shelter, and we can live there. That is how we are a little bit above the animal species. We have that ability. If we wanted to live underwater or live on, in space, we have the ability to make that happen, which is very different than the animals. Now, when we accept a challenge and we have to co confront fear or doubts, uh, there's an infinite litany of things that we have to process. And I learned years ago that no matter what you're doing and you commit yourself, you go through four stages. Now, these four stages aren't a checklist that you can rearrange in, in whatever pattern you want. The, any more than you can rearrange winter, spring, summer, and fall. They just kind of flow. And just like with a plumb bob, you know, when we push, our natural resistance is to rest. So we resist the commitment that we've made because it's not a balanced resting place. So we have to confront that commitment and that fear. And a lot of times that comes out in fear, uh, fear that we're not good enough, uh, fear that the idea isn't good. Uh, it comes out in fear. So those are the two, two phases. The first one is overcommit, and the second one is cry. And I find cry to be more of a barometer on how much you've committed to change. If you've just committed a little bit, you know, you feel a little queasiness in your stomach. If you committed a lot, you will feel real panic. Now, I'm sure everybody has felt that, but if you haven't, you can volunteer to do the sermon next week. <laughs> I learned this with the book Ron Roods, Vermont, when Ron asked me to illustrate that my first uh, professional career. Uh, I was so excited. Uh, I signed a contract to do 105 drawings in 45 days, and I just wasn't even thinking about what I'd signed. I was just so happy. And I had my list from Ron, you know, all the different things that I needed to illustrate, everything from a bobcat on top of a telephone pole. I now remember there was one of Pastor Day picking berries and being face-to-face -face with a bear. Um, there's all these little stories that only Ron could intertwine. And I had my list, and I went to the library, and I pulled out a nature book, and I counted the illustrations, and there were 15 illustrations. And I said, 15? I said, I, I, I need to do 105. So I pulled out another one, and it had a lot. It had all, all the way up to 30 illustrations. And when I left that library, I was in an absolute panic. My head was telling me, you know, your art career hasn't even started and you've ruined it already. Uh, you won't be able to do this. What were you thinking? Man, I mean, you really stepped in it this time because, boy, I don't know how you're going to get through this. And I literally sat on my bed shaking my head going, ah, oh, what did I do? And then the calming, the pray came. And it's like, okay, if I can do this, I am capable of doing decent work. So the fact that I'm not good enough, I, I don't need to listen to that voice. What would it take to do 105 drawings in 45 days? So I figured out that it was seven weeks, and at five days a week, if I did three drawings a day, it literally came out to 105. And in that way, I had my plan. And I still panicked a little bit. I still was like, ah, I don't know, can I do three a day? But as I executed the plan, which was meeting your deadline, that calmness started to happen. A couple things happened that I hadn't expected. 
Uh, first, I proved to myself that I could do a project like that. And since then, I've done other, like, bizarre, you know, deciding two weeks before the, the deadline to a uh, Vermont waterfowl stamp competition, deciding that, hey, I think I'll compete. <laughs> and in two weeks, doing a piece and winning the competition. It, it's through getting through that process, the more times you can get through that process, the easier it becomes to do, to execute the plan. Now, I've gone and witnessed this process over the years. Uh, I can remember the day that uh, Dave and Donna signed on the old hotel. They were very happy. I saw him in front of the store, but I saw the look on his face, and I realized that he was starting to realize what they had committed to. I've seen it with all kinds of people around. I've seen it on TV. Um, there are instances in the Bible where people were confronted with a challenge or a commitment, and they walked away. But the thing I'd like to point out is that there aren't a lot of those stories because people don't write stories about inaction. People don't write stories about the people who were asked to do something and they just turned around and walked away. So I'm sure during Jesus' time, there were plenty of people who could not confront that dream. Now, there is a time for rest. I, I want to be very clear that there is a time for rest. You pick a tomato from your garden that's 75% ripe, and you put it on the windowsill and let it ripen, there's the perfect time to eat that tomato. Now, rest becomes stagnation if you ignore that tomato and let it sit there for another couple months. So I have to ask myself, because I feel like I'm in that phase, am I resting or have I become stagnant? I think each of us as individuals could ask that question. We as a church or as a community, as a state, as a country, as, as believers connected all through the world, are we resting or have we become stagnant? Now, I heard a song that just totally blew me away and inspired me, and it was by uh, Lily Miola uh, in her song, Daydreams. And she expressed most, uh, expressed most, most lives brilliantly. Written in her early 20s, when she had a music contract that she had signed, she referred to herself as, I was at a point in my life where I was hatching butterflies. Now, doesn't that sound incredible? And then her mother got sick with cancer, and she let it all go to do what she needed to do and spend time with her mother. And after her mother's passing, she decided that it was time to look at that dream once again. And these are the three, first three verses that I think all of us can identify with, and I think it very poignantly points out the process that we've all gone through. When we were kids in the backyard, playing astronauts and rock stars, no one told us to stop us, called us unrealistic. Then suddenly you're 18. You go to college for your plan B. What you want is too risky, and you live for weekends and whiskey. We all got these big ideas. One day, they're replaced with fears. How did we get here? Darling, don't quit your daydream. If it's your if it, it's your life you're making. It ain't big enough if it doesn't scare the hell out of you. If it makes you nervous, it's probably worth it. Why save it for sleep when you could be living your daydream? Wow. I mean, think about that. This perspective puts a different spin on the fears and the insecurities that we have that stop us from doing these things that we think are great. We probably all have ideas or greats that we could, great ideas that we could act on, and we've talked ourselves out of it, or we've talked, I mean, I talked myself out for almost eight months on doing a community potluck. When I set my mind to do it, it was the easiest thing I'd ever done, you know, a simple text. So here's one idea, uh, how we could address a need in the community for affordable housing through starter homes. Now, this isn't a new concept for this church because 40 years ago, 
when uh, the women from the women's circle were coming home from a shop, Christmas shopping trip, one of the elderly in the group said, I don't know what we're gonna, well, I'm gonna do when Ernest passes away. Said, I've lived in Lincoln my entire life, and when he passes away, I would not be able to attend the house, and I would be forced to move out of the community that I love so much. And from that little honest observation, spurned a small group that became a bigger group that became a bigger group that created Weathervane, a very award-winning uh, there's probably I can't think of any I'm nothing in this community I'm more proud of than the way that this community reacts to uh, challenges like that it's an award-winning project now what I'm not I'm if we did this for our elderly Who's to say that we couldn't do this for our, our young families who also might have to leave because they can't afford a home in this area based on today's uh, real estate market values. Now, I'm not saying that we should perform what Weathervane did because what I've learned and observed from Weathervane is that it was a great project, but it's also taken 40 years of energy from people to maintain the property and to keep it running and to keep the programs going. Um, so it expends a fair amount of energy as well. But I'm thinking, you know, what would it look like to do a hybrid Habitat for Humanity slash Weather Vane project where we build a little two-story starter home? My home in the village right across from Burnham Hall started out as probably a two-story box. And then over time, as, as time evolved, family grew, they added on to the box. And then there's a third, uh, two more sections where they added on a little more and then they added on what's now our kitchen. But it started as that simple square box. Now, just to throw out some numbers, and these numbers are not accurate, and there's all kinds of things that would have to be figured out, but, um, Let's just say for $180,000, uh, due to volunteer labor and stuff, you could build a starter home. So you build the home. When it's done, you sell it. And then you use that money to build the next home. And then you sell that. So over five years, let's say, you did a house a year. You could end up with five starter homes in five years. I mean, in this community, I've seen us talk about what we're going to do for longer than that. <laughs> uh, so $180,000. If this church wanted to sponsor a project like that for a third, 60000 federal grants and state grants and other grants for another third, and the other third coming from some other source or sources, then we could end up with five homes for a $60,000 investment. And at the end of the five years, if you decide you don't want to build, then the last sale returns your money. It just seems like a workable plan to me. And I, and I know, as a designer myself, it always looks good on paper until you go to apply it. But I think the point I'd like to make is it all starts with a dream. It starts with somebody having a vision. Lyda Klo, who lived where Don and Jody Gale, saying, boy, I don't know what I'm going to do if er when Ernie passes away. And how an innocent statement like that could lead to what it did. The other part of this uh, plan that I can see happening is that if uh, there are a lot of community groups in this town fire department, the guys who have coffee in the morning, you know, there's all these little groups of people. A unifying community project like that is a way that these groups cross over lines and interact with each other. And I just think, God, that would just be so special. And that's just one dream. You know, there's, there's 50 people here. There's probably 50 dreams here. But how do we support each other and act on those dreams is what I think is important. So to conclude has really hit the nail on the head. 
Uh, so be bold enough to dream. Expect there to be a little fear and discomfort. Uh, it'll be a little scary, but what this community and what this church has shown me is that there are very few dreams that we can't accomplish if we want to. This is a very special place that we live in. We've done things that most communities envy. Uh, the library after the flood. I mean, you name it. Moving, a, moving historical society. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Even the, the schools shift right now. A group of people have a dream. They're pursuing that dream. What is your dream? What is my dream? I really need to sit back and think, am I resting or have I become stagnant? Thank you. Closing hymn is 473, Make Me a Blessing. Thank you for a benediction, Lord. Make us a blessing. We have dreams. We all have dreams, personal dreams, community dreams, dreams for our children and our family. Give us the faith to pursue those dreams. Let us understand that once we commit, nature and our instincts are going to be to rest. And we need to rest to a certain point. 
but we don't let us ever become stagnant. In your name, amen.